Check out FlipSideGaming.com for all your gaming needs. Use the promo code HEROES to save 10% on all orders over $10 and support the channel at the same time. This is John from Heroes and Legends. Welcome to part 5 of our 5-part Unstable Full Set Review, where today we're going to look at the faction Crossbreed Labs. So if you've been watching the series, you kind of know this is an unusual set review. We're doing it a little differently this time. Instead of color pie order, we're looking at factions. Today we're going to look at all of the cards that have the Crossbreed Labs watermark, as well as all of the green cards with no watermark, and we're going to wrap things up by looking at all the Host and Augment cards. Even though they don't have watermarks, they kind of feel very Crossbreed Labs-ish, so we put them into this particular segment. Quickly, before we get started though, if you check out the description below, you'll find a few ways to support the channel, one of which is Patreon. You're also going to find some places where you can get some products and support us that way. You have Amazon linked down there as well as Flipside Gaming. Always appreciated. You can find some unstable in those locations. Maybe save yourself some money, hopefully. So let's get into it with that being said, and let's see the first card as luck would have it. Okay, here's the deal with this card. Are you somebody who is very spiky, and just the thought of sitting down at the table and playing an unset and rolling all these dice is making your skin crawl, and you need some way to control it? Well, here's the card for you. <laughs> I'm like that. Like, I see these cards, roll a dice, roll a dice, roll a dice. And I'm like, oh my, would I really want to play this? And you kind of have to. And that's the whole point of this. It's just meant to be fun. You have to kind of let those expectations go. But what's nice about a card like this is now the spike in me can start to feel like, okay, if I can get this on the battlefield, it has hex proof. It's going to be really hard to get rid of, maybe even close to impossible. And now I'm going to just pay the one for it. And every time I roll the dice after that, it's going towards a goal. So even when I get bad rolls, some good's coming out of it. Maybe I can win. And it is an alternate win condition. A lot of people enjoy those. This card is actually super sweet. Now, I'm not going to play it unless I have a lot of dice roll going on, obviously. But if I do, then, yeah, I'll try it out and just see how it goes. It'll be kind of interesting to see. There's a little high variance in itself because if you get a lot of lower rolls, it's going to take longer to get to 100. But if you can get there and you have cards or are cards that allow you to convert mana into dice rolls, and we'll see at least one today, maybe more, but we've seen some before. So if you have some of those later in the game, you could try to expedite to try to get to 100. So yeah, it's actually pretty interesting. Beast in Show. Okay, not super exciting. I think we're a little spoiled nowadays. We kind of want our six drops to be six, six tramplers. <laughs> and when we see a six, four trample, like I just kind of turn my nose up at this now. Um, but is it playable? Is it a fine curve filler? Yeah, sure it is. And it's a nice way to get some damage across. Also, too, one of the key parts of Crossbreed Labs, especially once we get into the contraptions, is trying to build up creatures and make them bigger and kind of go tall. So a creature with Trample could actually be very, very good in this particular faction, which is probably why they brought the toughness down a little bit in this set. Chittering Doom. I want to like this card because I like tokens, but here's my issue with it. It costs four, doesn't do anything on its own. There's no ability on here that says, you know, pay mana to roll a die or something like that. So you're really dependent on your other cards. And then even when you do roll die, you have to get four or higher to get the squirrel token. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. There are cards, we've been talking about them this week, that augment your dice rolls. Sometimes they can buff your dice rolls. That's kind of nice. You don't always have to be rolling a six-sided die. I mean, usually you are, but there are cards like Sword of Dungeons and Dragons, for example. If you have that, maybe, okay, maybe I do play this if I have that in my deck. But a lot of the time, unless I'm not really all in on the idea of trying to go wide quickly and roll a lot of die, then I'm probably skipping this one. It just feels a little too high variance, even out of a whole set of high variance cards. Clever combo. Uh, this is actually a pretty sweet tutor card quite honestly. I mean, tutor up a host or an augment card, two mana, sorcery speed, but that's fine. And yeah, I'm happy to play this as long as I have some good targets for it. Druid of the Sacred Beaker. Okay, this is a good mana generating creature. I mean, it's a 2-2 two, two for 3, which feels pretty good considering the ability tied to it. And you can just tap this, and even if you have no other Crossbreed Labs watermark cards, this does have the watermark, so you at least get one green, so it ramps you a little bit. But if you can play this in conjunction with other cards with the watermark, this could get really, really sweet. And there's a lot of good X cards in the set. We saw some yesterday, we'll see some more today. So that could be very relevant. Or just ramping into something bigger or mid range -y could be great with this card. So just a really, really strong inclusion here. 
Earl of Squirrel, another card that I love. This card's awesome. <laughs> love the art, first off. In the promo version, it has amazing art, too. We saw that a few weeks back. But this thing, a 4-4 four, four for 6, okay, that's fine. But other squirrels you control get plus 1, plus 1. On top of that, creature tokens you control are now squirrels. So there's a lot of great creature tokens in the set. I mean, you have goblins, you have gnomes, you have some of these 2-2 two, two menace creatures we saw earlier. There's 1-1 one, one flying fairies that have curiosity built in, although you do have to sacrifice those at end of turn, typically. So, yeah, it's something that has a lot of versatility and a lot of reach into different portions of the set, which is pretty cool. Now, I haven't even touched upon Squirrel Link yet, because, yes, this has Squirrel Link. <laughs> Damage done by this creature also gives you that many Squirrel Tokens. And those Squirrel Tokens, as long as this creature stays alive, are two twos. There's a ton going on here for six mana. This is a fantastic rare. First pick. Okay. First glance at this card, you kind of think to yourself, all right, destroy target artifact or enchantments and do the thing the set kind of wants me to do. Very typical magic card. We see it all the time. Think a little harder about it, though. There are not a lot of ways in the set to deal with artifacts. And artifacts also encompass contraptions. <laughs> contraptions, some of them are very, very good. All of them are at least good. Some are incredibly good. And also there's some decent artifacts in here too. So considering that there's not a lot of ways to deal with artifacts, we'll see a few today. There's a few sprinkled around, but there's not a ton of them overall in the set. Consider that. Consider you also get to assemble a contraption, which is a nice little bonus. I think this card, just like it says, is actually first pickable. Hydra Doodle. Okay, it's a Hydra Poodle. So I don't know. Do I have to convince you to play this card? I don't think so, right? <laughs> like, look at the thing. All right. Now, the card itself actually is not bad. Yes, variants. I know, I know. But this is the set of variants. And you're going to have to make some decisions which variants cards you want to play. This one's not a bad one. Because think of it this way I pay four mana. I roll one six sided die. Maybe I hit a six or a five. Wonderful. If I hit a one or two, eh, not so great. But the thing has Reach and Trample, which really works well with the Crossbreed Labs contraptions we're going to see later. So Trample is going to be a commodity, definitely, within this particular faction. So even a smaller Trample creature could be really good for you down the road. So it gets mitigated a little bit. The variance level gets mitigated by that Trample ability. And if you get lucky, well, wonderful. And if you have more mana, maybe you have the Mana Ramp card we just looked at, and you can roll two or three die or something then, of course, it does mitigate the variance even more. So this is a pretty good card. It works better with other cards, obviously, in conjunction, but there's a lot that can happen. This can lead to a big play. Ineffable Blessing. Okay, this is a enchantment that doesn't do anything on its own that I actually don't hate. It costs two, so it's real cheap, and that's why I'm okay with it. And I'm going to pick Flavorful or Bland, either based on what's in my deck or maybe what's in my hand at the time. And yeah, I'm probably going to draw some cards. Even if this just replaces itself and draws one more card, I feel like that's worth the two mana. And I'll be pretty happy with it, just long run. And it could actually do more work than that. This also works in conjunction with other copies. So I can have two copies in play, one choosing Flavorful, one choosing Bland. That'd be nice too. Really epic punch. Okay, I love the art here. It's incredible for the fans of the Tarkir block. And... Uh, the card itself is really good, too, for two. First off, target creature you control gets plus two, plus two. It's not till end of turn. I don't know. That feels almost like a misprint to me. I don't know. It feels like if they wanted that to happen, they would have said just gets two plus one, plus one counters. But, okay, plus two, plus two. That's fine. And if it's a host or has augment, then it also can fight. So sometimes it's a removal spell, even when it's not. It's a nice little buff. Selfie preservation. Okay, I love the art here. Now, this is another card that actually is looking at the art on cards, which is cool. I love when they do that on sets. Now, worst case scenario, this card simply lets you maybe fix your color, make sure you don't miss land drops, and that's fine for two mana too. But if you search for a land that has a tree on the art, then you can put it right into play tapped, so it just accelerates things a little bit. I do like that quite a bit, and I checked for you, if you're playing with unstable lands, islands and mountains do not have trees, the other three do though, so you're safe with swamps, forests of course, and plains. Now, of course, you don't have to use unstable lands. You can use whatever lands you want. So start looking now for your lands with trees in them. Shell of Ints. Uh, this is a cool card, actually, for three mana. It feels pretty pushed at the casting cost. Turtle and or elf that's dependent completely on what the controller wants to do. Zero casting cost at any time. You can use that in any zone. Change it between 1, 4, and 3, 3. It makes it a little more aggressive at times, more defensive at other times. It can switch on the fly. For three mana, I'm on board. Sign me up. This is actually a really good card. 
Slaying Mantis. Okay, here's a dexterity card. A little expensive, in my opinion, for 7, considering it's a 6-6 six, six, and the level of variance that comes with throwing a card from 3 feet away. Um, just a second, that was a key word. Extra points for that. So, <laughs> that's actually pretty sweet. And, yeah, if you hit something and you can fight even one creature, it's probably worth the mana. It's just, can you pull it off, is the question. And, again, it's a sizable creature, which definitely will matter within the constraints of this particular faction, too. So, yeah, overall, it, it's fine. Like, I'll play this card. I mean, there's times I might have better high-curve cards that are more consistent, but it's definitely playable, no doubt. Squirrel Dealer. Okay, cool art on this card, but the card itself is a little weak. If I can get someone to agree with me the squirrels are awesome, then that's good, because the card then is actually decent. Even if I played it later, it's still decent. One green for 2-2 two, two power toughness on the battlefield, and of course there are some other things you can do with squirrels as we saw earlier. But if that's not the case, if you can't find anyone else around that will agree to that fact, <laughs> then it's not a good card. It's a 1-1 one, one for 1, and it's just not doing anything that matters, and you don't want to play that. So it just depends on your surroundings, I guess, more than anything. Willing Test Subject. It's actually a cool card because it does have a Mana Sync World Dice ability, and that could matter with a whole bunch of cards. Cards we're going to see today, cards we saw in other videos. So being able to force a dice roll like that later in the game is actually really, really good. The card itself is fine, too. A 2-2 two, two with reach for 3 feels pretty economical, even with that alone. And then whenever you roll a die for a higher, we'll give this thing a plus 1, plus 1. So again, it's roll a die. Usually that'll be 6-sided die. Again, there's ways to manipulate those dice rolls. We've seen plenty of them over the course of the week. There's the card that lets you roll a d20, which works here too. There's a lot going on here. And over time, if your opponent doesn't deal with this, the thing could get big. It could be a nice little block or two to deal with fire. So yeah, it's actually really, really good. Strong common. All right, let's look at these white cards with the watermark. And this is Gimme 5. Not really sure why this is Crossbreed Labs, but okay. I'll, I'll go with it. Um, it costs one white. It's an instant. And you gain some life. Now... If you're playing at, like, launch weekend, there's a ton of people at LGS, this is probably worth running because it's significant life gain. If not, if you're just playing at home, then I'm probably skipping this. So you don't want to just, like, gain one life or something like that. It's just not worth it. Success! Exclamation point. Okay, so this is a great combat trick, actually. Just even if you don't read that second sentence, one white, it's an instant. Target creature gets plus two, plus two till end of turn. Wonderful. Sometimes that will work in lieu of a removal spell for you. And beyond that, if it's a host or has augment, he gains lifelink. So even more bonus on top. So yeah, actually a very good pick up for a combat trick. Teacher's Pets. This is a 2-1 for 2. I want to point that out first because there's not a lot of 2-2s two for 2 in the set. There's a few, but a lot of times your curve filling 2 drops are going to be 2-1s. This one fits the requirement for that. It'll be just fine. The ability, also pretty good. White and two, sacrifice this, search your library for a card with augments, combine it with a target host you control, then shuffle. So if you do have some good augments slash host cards going on, this is a way to tutor for the augment and actually play it for kind of free. I mean, you're paying three and sacrificing this, but that is less than a lot of the other augment costs. Okay, better than one. This card confused a lot of people when it first came out, myself included, but Rosewater clarified it a little bit. Basically, which I guess we could have guessed from the art there, you're going to be playing a two-headed giant format once you play this card. So, yeah, you give the other player your stuff, or at least some of your stuff, whatever you want to give them, and then it becomes two-headed giant. So you share the life total. That doesn't change. So you're not, like, gaining, like, 20 life in a way by bringing someone else in the game. It doesn't work that way. So, yeah, it's actually pretty sweet. Now, how helpful is this to you if you bring in a good player? Maybe very. I don't know. If LSV is playing in the area, then who knows? Maybe he can come help you out. But better than one is going to really probably be stronger early on. It only costs two, so great. Not as good later on when your life total is low. It's not going to save you if you're behind, right? Like you have those issues with the card. It's not a card that's going to catch you up or stabilize you. So it's risky in that way. But it's also super fun, right? That's what this card's all about. And... Worst case scenario, think of it this way, it's kind of like drawing two cards a turn from that point forward, right? Because then you have this other player drawing another card as well. And resource-wise, if you play this early enough, you could win simply because of that reason. Dr. Julius Jumblemorph. I love this card. Wow, this card makes me really, really want to play like a silver-bordered variant of Commander. So many cards in this set really make silver-bordered Commander super appealing. <laughs> this may be my favorite. 
First, the art's beautiful. The I just love this creature on the card. Mythic, legendary creature. By the way, counts as every creature type. So, for you spikes out there, just between me and you, this is a sliver. So, <laughs> I'll get some comments for that, no doubt. But yes, this is a sliver among many, many other things. Squirrels, a lot of things that do matter within this limited environment, too. And 4-4 four, four base for 4, really, really awesome. And whenever a host enters the battlefield under your control, you may search your library and or graveyard for a card with Augment. Combine it so you get the free combine. And also, too, sometimes you're pulling a card back out of your graveyard. Tons of efficiency here. Love this card. I really want to play this card, like I said, in a true multiplayer game. It just feels like it could be so much fun. Proper laboratory attire. Okay, here's the lone normal artifact of this particular faction. And yeah, it's just fine. Protection from die roll. That's kind of quirky and interesting. Sometimes it'll be relevant. But even if it's not, giving something plus two plus one in a form of very cheap equipment could be good for this faction as well. All right. Let's talk about these contraptions because you'll kind of get the big picture now once we go into these and why having big creatures could be important or having trample could be important. So this is Arms Depot, and this is an uncommon one. Whenever you crank it, you get to put two plus one plus one counters on target creature. This is actually very good. Two counters on a creature every three turns, it grows something, and if the thing already has trample or some sort of evasion, wonderful. So yeah, this is going to play well with creatures with trample, flying, when you can make something unblockable, which Sneak was kind of doing a little bit a few days ago. A lot of different ways you can go with this. BB Gun. This one's the Mythic, and it's pretty good. Like, if your board state's sparse, it's not going to help you. So keep that in mind. Again, it's not going to help you from behind, unfortunately. But if you have one decent creature, and hopefully if you're in this faction, you will, then you do get a fight effect that you can trigger for two mana. You still have to pay for it. That's a little awkward compared to some of the other contraptions, which do everything for free. But okay, I'm fine with that. So you pay your two to fight. And yeah, it becomes a removal spell every three turns, potentially, depending on board state. So yeah, it's actually real sweet. Dog Snail Engine. Uh, this was the first contraption they ever previewed. And it is really amazing looking too, isn't it? But anyway... <laughs> Whenever you crank this one, target player gains life equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. So again, a payoff for having a high power creature, just what Crossbreed Labs wants. I mean, life gain is not thrilling to me most of the time, but again, if it can be significant over time, I'm really starting to pay attention to this card. It could become a lot better. And again, it's just a free roll. Also, I've said this in other videos, but keep in mind that these effects typically are pretty open-ended. They don't usually just say your creature or your stuff or whatever. This does say target player. This could be relevant maybe in multiplayer games or especially unique situations. So always keep that in mind. Read your contraptions very carefully. Genetic Recombinator. Okay, this is another one that is going to help with the size of creatures. This time temporary, though. Up to two target creatures. Each get plus two, plus two to end of turn. So this is good in a go-wide strategy. Also a go-tall strategy, so it fits into a few different places. Inflation Station. You guessed it. It's about getting bigger. Target creature gets plus three, plus three till end of turn. So this one's a common, but still, it's pretty significant to play on like a trampler or a flyer or something. Oaken Power Suit. Here's another one that's going to potentially make something really large. Whenever you crank this one, target creature gets plus X, plus X till end of turn, where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. So again, a little variance based on what you have on the board and your board state. It doesn't help you if you're really behind or anything, but if you're in a board stall or you just need to get a lot of damage across quickly, you have potential to do that now with a card like this. Quick Stick Lick Trick. Uh, this is going to be a plus one, plus one on lifelink till end of turn. And this is a little smaller, obviously. And again, lifelink maybe matters, maybe it doesn't. But the larger the creature is, the more it will matter. Refibrillator. Okay, this one is actually pretty good too. It's a rare. This time you get to return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. It doesn't go directly into play, but considering this is kind of a Selesnia faction, I feel like it's fair. It actually makes sense. It's still really good for you, considering this will happen hopefully more than once per game, every three turns. Sapsucker. This one's a little weak, but it's kind of good early in the game. If you can get this one out early on, getting that extra green a turn could matter, actually. And yeah, it speeds out maybe a mid-rangey creature or a larger creature earlier in the game than you normally would be able to. It feels pretty good. Later in the game, it might not matter. It might not do a whole lot. Interesting, too, the whole idea until end of turn, this mana doesn't empty from your mana pool as steps and phases end. So 
Sometimes that could be relevant. Maybe most of the time it won't be, but just something to keep in mind. I feel like it would have been cool if they said something like your mana doesn't empty out until your next turn or something like that. And that could have some weird implications perhaps for like multiplayer, but yeah, it's fine for common. All right. So let's talk about some augment cards and some host cards now. Now we're going to see things from all five colors here. The reason we just waited to the end to show them is because they all interact with each other. So I thought it'd make sense to kind of show them all together. Now the augment cards are basically dictating what the trigger is going to be for the host cards. The host cards all have abilities. So we're going to look at the augment first. We're going to see how much they buff the host creature, what they cost and what the trigger is. So this first one, half kitten, half, it's a cat, white. Whenever you're dealt damage, you get to trigger plus one, plus two, and the augments of white too. So in a case like this, I feel like this particular card, maybe not as good as some of the others, because you don't want damage to be taken to get things to happen. I mean, that is a little more defensive. You want to be probably more proactive than that. It's fine, don't get me wrong, because you're going to take damage in the course of a magic game. But there's maybe better cards at times in your pool. Humming, this course is a bird. This one's a common flying. That's very important because this does give the host flying, which again, as we saw, could matter a lot with Crossbreed Labs, among other places too. And whenever you attack with two or more creatures, you get the trigger. Plus two, plus three, costs a white and three. Rhino, this is nice for maybe more defensive posture. Whenever something blocks, now you're getting the trigger. This is turning something into a nice blocker with plus one, plus four, and only for four. It feels economical, a white and three. Half shark half. This is a good one. You're paying for it a little bit, but plus three, plus three, significant. And at the beginning of your upkeep, creating the trigger is actually really nice for a lot of these cards. Blue and five. I mean, like I said, you're going to invest in it, but it's worth it. Ninja. Okay, Ninja's awesome because you can actually play this anytime you can play an instant, unlike these other cards. And if you look at the reminder text, they remind you of that by saying augment only as, oh, never mind. So anyway... This one, plus one, plus oh, not huge, but the fact that whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, creates the trigger, and it only costs like black and two. This is great for Agents of Sneak, because a lot of times if you can get combat damage across, you get extra bonuses. Zombified. This one's actually kind of unique, because for a black and four, you can combine Zombified from your graveyard with target host. So you can actually play it out of your graveyard, which is pretty cool. The regular cost is also the same, a black and four. So black and two, exile a creature card from your graveyard to perform the trigger. Maybe not that exciting because it is from your graveyard. You can't pick into other people's graveyard, unfortunately. And also, too, it's costing you mana to do it. But as long as you have creatures to remove, that does mean you could get the trigger more than once per turn. But it is a little restrictive, if nothing else. So maybe not one of my favorites. But I do like the fact that you can play this out of the yard. That's pretty cool. And it's still a plus two, plus two. Half Orc, half, and this gives Trample, which can be very relevant at times, as we saw today. Plus three, plus one as well, which is kind of nice at the beginning of each end step. If an opponent was dealt damage, then you get the trigger. Two red and one actually feels pretty reasonable for this. Half Squirrel, half. This time around, your creature actually gets smaller. Minus one, minus zero. Augment's only one green, though, and whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield, you get the trigger. That's actually a really good way to trigger something, because that's not just your creatures. Notice, whenever a non-token creature enters, you get the ability. Monkey, plus two, plus two for a green and two. Whenever a non-token creature you control dies this time, you get the trigger. Multi-headed, plus four, plus four. That's actually pretty significant, and I think it's reasonable, considering you're paying a green and four, and you're getting the, at the beginning of each end step, if you roll to die this turn, <laughs> and again, that's going to be better in some decks than others, but there's a lot of die roll cards. You can really probably take advantage of that quite a bit. Serpentine, plus three, plus three. Again, very fair for a green and two. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you get the trigger. So basically landfall. That's actually really sweet. I mean, these are competitively costed, but part of the reason is you do have to have a host creature on the battlefield. And if you don't, these things are kind of stuck in your hand. So that's the drawback, and that's why they're giving them a pretty decent casting cost. Robo, artifact creature construct plus one plus one at the beginning of each end step. If an artifact entered the battlefield under your control this turn, you get the trigger. Only costs two, so I don't think that's bad at all. Especially if you're in Order of the Widget and you have like gnome tokens and stuff like that going on. Steam powered. This is nice for two reasons. Early on, nice little blocker, plus O, plus four to whatever you're hosting it with. And then, of course, the augment's only four. For five, which is repeatable, by the way, you get the trigger of the card. So 
the trigger becomes something that you can sink mana into later, which for some of these will be really, really good. All right, let's look at these hosts. And I will say this, now that we saw the augment cards, the hosts are more of a complete card, obviously. Like, you can play these without the augment cards. So when you build your deck, you probably want to have more hosts than augments because you don't want to get flooded with augments that you can't actually use. So you have to be really careful with that when you're building your deck and doing your strategy, right? So, but let's look at the hosts for now. Adorable Kitten, this one costs a white, it's a 1-1, one, one. it's adorable. When it enters the battlefield, roll a six-sided die, you gain life equal to the result. Now, if you have a lot of cards that matter when you roll die, they're looking for die rolls, then maybe I play this. But just for the life gain, I'm probably not running this. I'll probably just run something else. Ordinary Pony. Okay, this is great with like enters the battlefield effects on creatures. You can get a little bit of extra value there. If you don't have any of those, though, it's not a bad creature. A 2-3 three for 3 with a potential to augment it probably makes this worth running most of the time, quite honestly, in this particular set, even if it's just a curve filler. Also important to note that if you combine this with Half Squirrel Half, which we saw a few moments ago, it will not go into an endless loop. Uh, that was kind of a mistake in the actual rules text. So they have amended that. And they've changed it to say that you can only flicker each of your creatures once per turn. So you can flicker everything once, but you can't create an endless loop. Shaggy Camel. This is a temporary buff to everything, though. Great if you're trying to go wide, maybe you have a strong token strategy or something like that. It's also a 3-3 three, three for 4 on its own, which is pretty good. You get the trigger when it enters the battlefield, which is nice for maybe one really big attack. And then later on, the potential to do this again exists out there. Crafty Octopus. A decent card if you care about your contraptions a lot, if you want to get them out quickly. Uh, this card will help you do it because you can do this as early as turn 3 and has potential for more contraption assembly later on, depending on what augment you have. Merman. All right, my favorite words are on this card. You may draw a card. This is the card they put in the set to keep the spike players happy after all those dice roll cards. So <laughs> this is a 3-3 three, three for 5. You know what? It replaces itself. I'm going to play this and be pretty happy with it because if I can augment this thing on top of that, yeah, this card's tons of value. I mean, think of some of the augments we saw. The Serpentine, for example, plus three, plus three, and then whenever I play a land, I draw a card. What? Yeah, sign me up. You also saw the Locomotive, where you can turn this into a pay five draw card. There's tons of things you can do to exploit this. I love this card. This is one I definitely want to play with in Limited. Numbing Jellyfish. Okay, here's another mill card. This one's a common. We saw a mill card a couple days ago, but if you really wanted to try to say draft a mill deck, you're going to need to pick up a number of these at common. I wouldn't really recommend that strategy, though. With that being said, I don't think the card's bad, because it's a 2, 3, for 4. If you augment it, it could become sizable. And you know something? That mill effect, especially with a good augmentation that allows you to recur that ability, that actually could put some pressure on an opponent. Even if it doesn't mill them out, it starts putting them on a clock, it starts to make them have to think about how they can put you away quickly, and it gives you a little extra comfort, a little extra room if you're playing a more defensive game. So, yeah, you don't have to go all in necessarily on mill, and in fact, I wouldn't recommend it. But if it's a sub game in your deck, I don't think it's bad. I think these cards are very runnable. Also, too, there's times you may want to mill yourself with this because there are some graveyard shenanigans in the set. Big Boa Constrictor, 1, 2 for 4. Well, that doesn't feel so good on paper, but it is a host creature, which means it can be buffed later on through augmentation. So you do keep that in mind. The ability itself, not super exciting either, just on its own. It's another high variance die roll ability. Maybe my opponent loses one life. Maybe they lose six or something in between. I mean, five or six would be pretty good, even four. But we start getting into the lower numbers. Is it really worth it at the end of the day? Now, I would say under normal circumstances, no, I'm probably going to skip this one. But there are reasons that I would play this in my build. And here they are. First one would be maybe I'm in like a League of Dastardly Doom deck that's playing some of the small damage spells. This complements those pretty well. Another reason, and maybe more importantly, in black you have the buff spells for some dice, and that's actually pretty sweet. If you do have ways to increase your dice rolls, then all of a sudden this gets a lot better automatically. And then finally, good augment creatures. If I have some good augment creatures and I think I can trigger this multiple times in a game, it becomes much better. Even if I'm only doing like ones, twos, and threes, and I'm having really bad rolls, if I can do this three or four times during the course of a game, that could cancel out the bad luck, right? So yeah, it definitely has its place. I mean, it's not an amazing card in all builds, and a lot of times, like I said, it's going to sit in my sideboard, but there are times where it's pretty good. Dirty Rat. 
This is a card that I might run like a one of or something like that. The good news about this card is if you play this early, it could disrupt your opponent's plan a little bit. Granted, they get to choose what to discard, but that kind of disruption can be kind of annoying, especially coming out of deciding whether they're going to keep their hand or not. Now, as the game goes on, this card gets kind of worse. Even if you can trigger it again and again with a good augmentation, the sad part is at some point your opponent's just going to be able to play around it. They're going to just start dumping their hands. They're going to know that the next discard's coming and they'll prepare for it. Not to say it can be annoying if they're trying to hold on to some sort of like damage spell or destroy spell or something like that. But yeah, you know, it's not going to hurt them as bad as maybe some other things that you could put in your deck would at certain points. So I could see myself running one of these, but maybe no more than that. Stinging Scorpion. This is actually a fine card on its own, a 3-2 for 5, and also giving an opponent's creature minus 1, minus 1 till end of turn. It's actually pretty good for either getting rid of something small. There's a lot of one-toughness creatures in this set, some of them very powerful. Also, too, it's good to set up a good combat, perhaps, in certain situations. So, alone, I like the card. Perhaps I augment it, do it again, it gets even better. Bubbling Pangolin. Okay, so this one is another Destroy Artifact card. And like I said earlier, there's not a lot of them. Now, this one is a common, which is kind of nice. So if I see these, I'm going to try to pick them up in a draft, quite honestly. A 2-2 for 4, destroy target artifact. Feels pretty sweet to me, actually. It's going to deal with some contraptions, some other problematic artifacts. And again, if you have some augment cards to go along with this, this effect could be reoccurring multiple times. Common Iguana. This is going to give you a rummage when it enters the battlefield. It's also a good curve filler. I mean, a 1-3 for 2. I mean, one rummage isn't super exciting. It's good, though. But where this gets really interesting is if, again, you can augment it, of course. Feisty Stegosaurus. Okay, this is a card very similar to the bow in a lot of ways. Stats feel a little mismatched compared to the casting costs 5 or 2, 1. The roll, the dice, abilities here again. So again, high variance. This time, instead of having a player lose life, you're damaging your creature. You could argue that's a little more universal as far as an ability you might actually want in more builds. And yeah, it's good, again, if you can roll high enough to take out a creature. But imagine you play this for five and you can't destroy the creature. You hit it for like one or something. It's like a two, two or three, three. That's not going to feel real good at the end. You just end up with a two, one for five. Like, ouch, that is bad. Now, if you do have the ability to augment this thing and then the trigger could happen more times, that's a different story. And again, the augment will buff the power and toughness as well in most cases. So that could be good, too, for the card. But again, you're kind of jumping through hoops at that point. I don't know if I like that that much. The other way I'm going to consider this card again is if I do have a way to buff my die rolls or something like that, then this card does become a lot better. So again, much like the bow, I'm not using it in all builds, but certain builds I think will be okay. Eager Beaver. Okay, this is a 3-2 for 3. I'm already on board. This card is great for unlimited. You'll be happy with those stats. And also, you may untap target permanent when it enters the battlefield. So that's really good. It can untap a land for potentially a follow-up play, something like that. And again, of course, even better if you can augment it. Mother Kangaroo. All right, 1-1 one, one for 5. Yikes. But the good news is when it enters the battlefield, roll a 6-sided die, and you put that many counters on it. So potentially it could be a little bigger. Worst case scenario, I guess it's a 2-2. Two, two. That's not real good. But what I like about this card is it could lead to potentially multiple die rolls down the road if you can augment it. So if you can find a trigger for this thing that works, every time you roll the dice it gets bigger. That's great, especially for some of the synergies in Crossbreed Labs. Secondly, you're going to be able to perhaps turn on some of the effects on some of these other die roll matters cards. There's a lot you can do with this. It looks a little weak compared to casting cost on paper, but if you can get past that and look at some of the synergies, it could be a decent card in a lot of builds. Wild Crocodile. This is good early game, maybe not as great later in the game unless you can really buff it with a strong augment. Early, though, it's wonderful. It can color fix, it can make sure you hit your early land drops, and even if you don't care about the 1-1 creature in play, like it's just there, like who cares, it kind of did its job, and maybe just chump block with it or something like that. But if you can augment it later on and maybe have a decent-sized creature on top of it, yeah, it could be good for you. I can see myself running at least one of these in a build. Angelic Rocket. This one is super sweet. Now, you're paying for it. It costs eight, so it's going to take you a little time. But it's a 4-4 Flying Angel artifact creature, and you may destroy target non-land permanent when it enters the battlefield. Sign me up. That's super sweet. A little bit of ramp to back it up would be nice. But even if you don't have that in a normal limited game, eventually you usually get to eight. 
So I don't know about this particular format, though. I guess we'll have to sit down and play and see how fast it is. But generally, though, I think this will be just fine for you. And imagine if you can augment this thing and get that ability more than once. That could be game winning. No made engine. All right, this is going to create some gnome tokens, which is really good for Order of the Widget, but it's also really good if you're just trying to go wide or whatever, just building out your board state. It's a 2 2 for 4. That doesn't feel really good on paper, but remember, you do get the gnome token when it enters the battlefield. So it's actually 3 3 for 4 power toughness on the board. So that's actually pretty on par, and I am fine running something like that. And it's a common, so you'll be able to pick these up. Again, if you can augment it, get that ability to trigger more than once, tons of value to be had down the road. Labrobot, okay, this costs 5 for a 3 3, but you do get to return target host card or card with augment from your graveyard to your hand when it enters the battlefield. If you have enough targets in your deck, this is very runnable. If you don't have a lot of host slash augment going on, then I'm going to skip this one. But I think if you have enough, it is worth running a copy of. Voracious Vacuum, okay. So this one is another artifact, 1-1 one, one for 3, but put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on target creature. So again, think of it as a 2-2 two, two for 3, which is still not great, but not as bad. Again, this is one you're only going to want to play if you're pretty sure you're going to be able to consistently augment it. If you don't feel like you have enough augment in your deck, this is probably one that you skip. Hey, guess what? We made it. That is the full set review. So, I don't know. Unstable as a set. It might be a little niche. Maybe it's not for every Magic player. But I'm glad we did a set review. I had a lot of fun going through the cards. I don't like when the game takes itself too seriously. And this is obviously the opposite of that. And there's some amazing cards in here. And I really hope that it sells well, that we see more unsets in the future. I hope that we start to see more maybe silver border constructed play, whether that's some sort of variant on Commander that maybe eventually becomes either fan driven or official or perhaps some sort of like block format or something like that. I don't know. It feels like it could open this set could open a lot of possibilities for silver border just generally. And I kind of hope that happens because this is super sweet. And, you know, these were fun to go through. Very lighthearted. I think all of us could use something like that every once in a while. So happy to see this set. Maybe we'll get another one someday. Mark Rosewater did a really good job. Glad to see this happening. So with that being said, hey, hope you get a chance to play with it. It comes out December 8th. I'll be opening some product on the channel. Until next time, though, thanks for watching. Please remember to like, subscribe. Have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible by the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store, where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon, and have a great day.